Hey, so um, before we get too far into this, I need to make the disclaimer that I'm not any sort of professional necessarily. I, um, you know, I grew up in the Appalachians, so I've been shooting guns since I was pretty little. But uh, I first got my own first gun uh, a little over four years ago now. So um, I do have that much experience. I've got a few handguns now. I've had a couple rifles. Um, I've built a few of them. Um, you know, it's not like I designed them from the ground up, but you know, you get like parts kits and shit like that. And it's like building a computer. You really customize it that way. But anyways, uh, this is going to be a lot more introductory than that. Um, just some basic shit, uh, for someone who's looking for their first gun and usually it's going to be a handgun. Um, some things that, uh... I guess you could say almost mistakes that I see a lot of new people making. Um, the number one thing I want to start with just immediately is something that I feel doesn't really get talked about enough and is a really common pitfall for new gun owners who are especially looking at handguns. Um, small is not necessarily a good thing. If you're going to carry it concealed, then you don't want it to be too big. But you can get away with more than you would expect. Um, beyond that, the weight matters in terms of handling. So a lot of people, they kind of have like a video game logic thing going on where they see a small gun and they think, oh, it must not be that powerful, etc. Everything about power and recoil and shit like that honestly comes from the cartridge. Now, the gun itself, the way that it operates, and the size and handling of it can help to mitigate the recoil, but the size of the gun itself does not necessarily matter for that. Um, like I said, a bigger, heavier gun will help you control the recoil more, but the recoil isn't coming from the gun, it's coming from the cartridge. So, say you have a gun that's just this really tiny thing fits in the palm of your hand basically it's chambered in nine millimeter now take a much larger gun that's got a steel frame it's really heavy it's like almost two pounds and it's chambered in say 380 that bigger gun is going to shoot so much more gently because it's a slightly smaller cartridge and a much bigger heavier gun that you can get a full grip on so honestly that tiny nine millimeter probably not going to be that much fun to shoot. It's going to be jumping all over the place and the the webbing of your hand like right there between your thumb and your index finger with really tiny pistols shooting cartridges like 9mm or god forbid 40 or even 45. They will hurt that part of your hand eventually. I don't care how tough or big you think you are. It's just it's not like something like, you know, I'm not saying oh you're going to need to go to the hospital. Obviously not. But it just becomes uncomfortable. It's annoying. It really is. Um, also, slide bite, which is where the, the slide of the semi-automatic semi pistol, sorry. Um, the part that goes back and forth on top, basically. Um, as it's moving backwards, it can come across the top of your hand there. And that can also be more likely on a smaller pistol. Um, larger pistols are going to have a larger beaver tail, which is like the part of the frame that curves up under the back of the slide and sticks off of the back of the gun. Larger guns are going to have a bigger one, and the slide is going to be a little bit higher up from your hand, so that's going to be less likely to happen. So in general, a larger gun should be a lot more comfortable to shoot, assuming it's in the same cartridge or a smaller one. Now, a big gun like that in 40 Smith & Wesson or 45 ACP, Versus a tiny gun in 22, the tiny gun's going to be a lot easier to handle, obviously. Because 22 is just so much smaller and less, less of a propellant charge, a lot less of a propellant charge than those other things. So, other thing to, um, I guess the second biggest one, uh, cartridge selection. 9mm is just fine. 380 is honestly still just fine. Um, 40... Is a little more powerful than 9mm, but it's honestly a bit unnecessary. It's such a close race that you're getting more recoil, uh, more expensive ammunition, and maybe slightly less magazine capacity, meaning you know how many rounds you can fit in the gun at one time. Um, 45 especially is going to have a lot less magazine capacity, a lot more recoil, more expensive. Um, it, again, it's it's even more effective slightly than 40 which is slightly more effective than 9mm, but again, the differences are so small. 
I would really just stick to 380 or 9 millimeter. Um, 9 millimeter is probably the most common. Price wise, I don't know how it holds up to 380. Um, you might just want to check that out yourself, um, especially because prices change so much. By the time you're watching this, who knows what the the ammo economy looks like? Holy shit, I can't talk. Okay, anyways. So, um, steel frames versus polymer frames. Steel frames are going to be heavier, um, which can be nicer to shoot, but also less fun to carry. <laughs> um, polymer frames are fine. Don't let anyone tell you that polymer frames are like, you know, oh, they're like Tupperware. They're like children's toys. They'll break on you. Mm, not really. Um, price and brand is another really big one. Um, Taurus, pretty much garbage. Uh, don't buy that. Um, let's see, uh, a really, some of the better brands, I'll say, um, Smith & Wesson is usually fine, Glock is pretty much industry standard, uh, they're not the best ever, but they're still really good, um, perfectly fine, uh, CZ is kind of rare and unheard of, but if you can get one, great guns, uh, Sig Sauer is pretty good, um, they're up there with, like, CZ and Glock, um, Springfield Armory uh, doesn't have the best reputation. They're just, uh, you know, they could be charging about fifty bucks less for what they offer. I suppose uh, they're fine, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna like blow up on you. And they will work, but they're also not the greatest. Um, a lot of Springfield Armory's pistols, like the XD series, for example, um, they have a grip safety, which is on the grip of the pistol on the back, underneath that beaver tail part I was talking about. There's a piece there that if it's not pushed in, the gun can't fire. Which, of course, if you're actually holding the gun in your hands, then it should be pressed in, just like that. Um, a lot of people like it as a safety feature, but it's really unnecessary, and it adds another potential f point of failure into the gun. Every new feature you add, adds something that could potentially break. And if something goes wrong with that grip safety, your gun's fucked. So, I don't see the point. Um... A lot of people are really, a lot of new people especially, are kind of touchy about safeties. They want a manual safety. Most guns these days, like clocks, for example, don't have a manual safety. And that's fine. Uh, the only external safety feature on a Glock is there's a little blade thing on the front of the trigger. It's not actually sharp. It's just a thin piece of plastic um, that has to be pressed in for the gun to fire. And of course, if you're pulling the trigger, then you're already going to be pressing that in. So it's not really something you have to think about, but it is something so that the gun can't fire, basically, if there isn't somebody or something pressing the trigger. Um, drop safe features like that are really common on just about every modern manufactured gun. Um, there, there's a thing called a firing pin block. You can only see it if you actually open up the gun and look inside the slide. But basically, unless the trigger is being pulled... Because what happens is there's there's a little arm connected to the trigger mechanism that whenever you pull the trigger, that lever lifts up and presses against this little round thing that basically it presses it towards the top of the slide. If it doesn't press that out of the way, the firing pin can't drop. And if the firing pin can't drop, it can't poke the back of the cartridge, the primer is what that is, to fire the round. Um, just about every pistol out there nowadays has that on it really old pistols which if you're buying your first gun don't go for like some world war one relic um but really old pistols like that may not have them but just about anything that's been manufactured in the last 40 or more years will have a firing pin block um the trigger itself is kind of a safety in that they're not that easy to press accidentally um so you're really going to be fine. I wouldn't be afraid of a Glock or something. Just make sure that you have an actual good holster for it. Uh, that's probably another thing I should talk about. Is holsters are really important. Please don't get one of those like universal nylon ones that like you can just cram whatever pistol you want into. Um, the fit's probably not going to be that great, and the material itself is kind of flexible, which is not that good. I got to cut the video here. I'll be right back. Okay, so the flexible nylon holsters, that's a problem. It can also be a problem with leather. Um, initially, leather is fine, but as it ages and it gets worn in, it can start to be flexible too. This is a problem because if the part around the trigger, where your trigger goes when the pistol is holstered, if the part there starts to kind of bend into the holster, that can cause an accident. Um, so really, these days, everyone uses a Kydex holster, which is a kind of plastic 
really any kind of you know rigid plastic like that that's good and durable will do um like i said leather's fine as long as like you know once it starts to get worn out you might want to replace it they're also i think they're hybrids that have it reinforced with some kind of rigid material so that it doesn't do that um you're gonna have to look into those options yourself but definitely like some cheapo like uncle mike's or amazon brand like you know some no-name fucking chinese shit off of amazon nylon holster um not worth it it's uh it might present a safety issue it's not going to give you very good retention on your pistol so it's more likely that you might drop the fucking thing which as i said is totally safe it's not a movie um you if you drop a gun the worst that can happen is you might fuck up something on the gun like you know one of your sights if you have like cheap plastic sights or something they might break or something but it's not going to fucking go off unless you have messed with something there's something wrong with it or like i said it's like a world war one relic you know maybe worry about dropping those but modern guns it's it's going to be fine um but still still it's 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 embarrassing and potentially illegal and um dangerous for other reasons to drop your gun in public um so your holster retention is something to consider um as far as open carry goes don't do it uh, it's stupid. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, I think that there should be no right to, but just because the right exists does not mean that it's worth utilizing. Um, it just makes you a target. Somebody's going to grab your gun, fucking shoot you or somebody else or something. Um, of course it's not guaranteed, but the, the opportunity exists and just why, why create the possibility for that situation to happen if you don't need to. So, um, yeah, outside the waistband holsters, those are for if you're going to have like a coat or something that goes over it. If you're just going to wear that with like a t-shirt or something, like I said, you're, you're open carrying at that point, And that's, that's dumb. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little blunt. Um, I don't mean to sound judgmental, but, um, it is what it is. Uh, Fuck let's see all right i never even really talked about price pricing at this point um you know as i'm recording this i'm probably going to post it within days of me recording it so you should be able to see from the the date posted below roughly when this came out after covid and everything and of course we we have a democratic president right now um all that shit um attentions on the global stage everything like that kind of affects the gun and ammo market in a big way. So every time a Democrat gets elected or there's like tension going on in the world or like a pandemic situation or like natural disasters being predicted, people will run out and buy shitloads of ammo. And a lot of people just straight up, they don't know anything about guns, but they decide to get one um, because, you know, the, the apocalypse is coming or whatever. <laughs> of course, the apocalypse never comes. Um, but uh, that drives up prices in a big way and also screws with availability and shit like that. So um, as of this point, I would say probably the cheapest you could get like a decent working gun, probably about $300. Um, I think high points are still cheaper than that, but honestly, those are not good at all. Uh, the thing with high point is that they work. And that's about the best you can say about them. They have terrible ergonomics. They're huge. They're ugly. Um, they're single stack, which means that there's only a straight line of bullets in the magazine, which means they only hold like, what, seven to nine or something with a standard capacity magazine. Uh, a double stack magazine is the other option where they're like kind of staggered, right? One next to another inside the magazine. And it makes the pistol a little bit wider, but it also holds twice as much ammunition or more. Um... So that's something to consider. Um, basically, don't get a high point unless you literally cannot save up enough money to buy another pistol. Um, if you're going to spend any more money than that, skip over Taurus. Um, kel has a mixed reputation. I wouldn't fuck with them either. I think the cheapest brands that you're going to have much luck with are going to be Ruger, Smith & Wesson, um, Walder. Let's see trying to think of others kind of in that category uh maybe fn is some of their cheaper ones might be in that category i'm not sure about that fn might be a little bit more expensive 
basically, you've got your Ruger, your Smith & Wesson, your Walder, um, brands like that. Those are going to be the lowest decent price tier. If you want to go a little higher than that and get something that's like really just a good all-around, no-complaints pistol, that's going to be Glock, Sig Sauer, CZ, maybe FN. Um, I've heard of issues with some FNs, but I've also heard of issues with some SIGs. The thing is, I know SIG in particular had one pistol, and it's already been fixed at this point. Um, they came out with a pistol that they did not realize initially, but later found was not totally drop safe. In very specific conditions, this one model of pistol could go off if dropped in a very particular way. Um... The thing is that there are safety standards and also the gun community will ridicule your ass to hell and back if you release a pistol that isn't 100% drop safe. So that kind of ruined SIG's reputation for a hot minute. They had to recall and fix all of those pistols. And I think they've pretty much learned to never let something like that slip by again. So anything above like the $300 to $400 category it's going to be drop safe as long as it's not another thing by the way um as a pistol first comes out don't buy it immediately uh being an early adopter does not necessarily pay in the firearms world um give it a few months let them make sure you know when it comes into customer hands the the end user is going to put it through all kinds of crazy trials and tribulations that the the safety board and uh, the engineers may not have come up with. Um, so customers may find in the initial months something wrong with it. It's not it's not always going to happen, um, but sometimes it does, and there's usually a recall and it gets fixed. So don't buy something that just came out. Usually, I wouldn't recommend that. Go with something that's been out a few years, and if you do that. If you go with something that's been out a few years and it's not like dirt ass cheap, it's probably going to be just fine. Um, as for revolvers, I'm not really a revolver guy. I can't tell you too much. Um, the way that they're shaped makes them kind of awkward to carry. I'm not going to lie. Um, the ergonomics, uh, you know, love them or hate them. It's kind of an individual thing there. But a lot of semi-autos can be pretty different in that regard as well. Uh, so if you haven't tried a semi-auto that you like yet, Keep trying them. You'll find one. Um, some pistols just seem to fit you better than others. There is that. Uh, as far as revolvers go, of course, the main downside is they're going to have a much slower reload time. And also, um, they're only going to hold five to six, usually five for like a decent concealed carry option. Because like I said, the, the round cylinder thing just creates a sort of bulge that is just a little awkward to carry sometimes. Whereas semi-autos have a very flat profile. Um, so there's that, um, revolvers are notorious for being really reliable. That's kind of true, but semi-autos these days are pretty damn reliable. And usually if something's wrong with a semi-auto, it's the magazine and you can just use a different magazine and that'll usually fix it with a revolver. If something goes wrong with a revolver, Ooh boy, <laughs> you're going to have to take that thing apart and, um, you know, some of those things can look like a fucking Swiss watch on the inside. Uh, you might have to take that to gunsmith to get it sorted out. I've never had a problem with any of my semi-autos that I couldn't sort out myself. And also, I've never had a problem with any of my semi-autos that wasn't my own fault. Like, for example, my most recent semi-auto pistol, my Glock that I built. Uh, at first, it didn't work, and that was because I had an aftermarket recoil spring assembly in it that just didn't quite fit. I could kind of tell something was a little weird because it was really hard to get the slide all the way back and to lock open when I was like actually finished building it, but I hadn't fired it yet. When I took it out to shoot it, it couldn't get through a magazine without a malfunction. So I bought a new recoil spring assembly. I'm going to have to cut the video again and come back. Right, my Glock. I, I, brought an, I bought a new recoil spring assembly, put it in there, and I fired hundreds of rounds to it. Not a malfunction since. Um, my first gun ever... It was a CZ-75 Compact. And that gun, I have fired at this point... I stopped counting at 7,000 rounds, and that was a couple years ago. <laughs> so I've, I've shot it a lot, and I've never had a single malfunction with that pistol. That's the level that semi-autos are at these days. So I'm not sure that you should worry too much about, like, revolver reliability. 
as long as you're getting a semi-auto that, like I said, isn't like a Taurus or a kel and it's not like a used one that's been put through some real shit that you don't know about, um, it should be just fine. I, I rarely see any reliability issues out of semi-autos. Just make sure you clean and oil it on occasion. Um, you know, don't leave it in the bottom of a pool. <laughs> try to carry it after that when it's all nice and rusted but you shouldn't do that to a revolver either that's that would fuck it up just the same so yeah i i don't know that i recommend revolvers i don't necessarily see an upside to them um that said if if you're only if the only other guns that you're willing to carry already have a really small magazine capacity um and you just really really like the feel of a revolver okay you know knock yourself out um, you'll be fine. It's, it's, it's not going to put you at a significant downside. Um, as far as the reload thing goes, most like civilian non-law enforcement, like defensive shootings are going to be over in two to three rounds. So the likelihood that you might have to reload, it does exist. It is a possibility, but it's a slim one. Um, it's so like me with my semi-autos, I carry the gun itself in just one spare magazine and for my Glock in particular, for example, my Glock only holds six to a magazine. So I've only got a total of 12 rounds on me, which is not a lot. But again, the, the possibility that I'm going to need more than that is pretty slim. Um, you know, at that point, it's either like, number one, you need to shoot better. <laughs> like if you've missed so many shots, something's wrong. Number two, if there's so much distance between you and them that that's making you miss, that's the problem is that they're like fucking half a football field away. What's going on that you're in a gunfight with them? Number three, you know, after fucking expending all of your ammunition, if the problem isn't dealt with, I don't know what to tell you at that point. Um, you are really in some deep shit. Um, <laughs> I, I would hope that there's an AR nearby that you can have. Because like, what is even going on? Like, how many fucking... How many enemies are you, like, attackers are you squaring up with at that point? So I'm not, I'm not too worried about, um, you know, with revolvers, the slow reload time. You might not have to. Even if you do, there are speed loaders for revolvers that um, they're still not going to be quite as fast as a semi-auto, but they do help. Um, anyways, let's see. What else can I... I'm trying to think of, like, beginner stuff. I don't need to go into, like, you know, ballistics tables or <laughs> shit like, um, you know, various, like, operating... There's, like, you know, direct blowback. There's um, certain kinds of, like, delay systems. Um, there's the, the typical, like, browning, tilting barrel. There's rotating barrels, shit like that. I don't need to go into any of that, I don't think, for a beginner. Um, I don't think you really need to know that right off the bat. Um, honestly, I think I pretty much carried, uh, covered it. Um, make sure before you do anything that you know the laws in your area. Um, because there are federal laws and then there are state laws and then some cities have city laws as well, municipal codes. Um, for example, a state where there's no magazine capacity restrictions in that state, certain cities will have magazine capacity restrictions. It's, um, it's dumb, but, um, you know, cities are kind of associated with crime and a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, there's, there's a... There's an economic disparity in cities, and there tend to be more sort of economically unprivileged populations condensed into cities. Um, and all of those people living closely together, especially, um, it's just a totally different sort of vibe, I guess, from like the suburbs or rural areas. So cities just tend to have more crime, but a lot of people, you know, unfortunately, sometimes even lawmakers, kind of just think, you know, oh, as long as we keep guns out of these people's hands or, like, limit how effective of a gun they can get, um, you know, oh, it's going to totally have such a big impact on the crime rate. And it's like, no, crime is mostly an economic thing, I gotta say. Um, <laughs> until the, the standard of living, the average standard of living goes up in your city and the slums are no longer slums, then I'm sorry, you're going to have a crime problem. They're just going to use knives instead of guns or fucking <laughs> pipe bombs even who knows um it's not impossible to just straight up beat somebody to death or strangle them with your bare hands um you know people find a way baseball bats whatever 
Um, so, anyways, <laughs> political grandstanding aside, um, yeah, your city might have particular ordinances, uh, especially if you're going to be in one of the biggest ones in the country, like Chicago, New York, whatever. Um, check with your city, for sure. But somewhere like where I live, for example, out in the fucking boonies, um, just federal law and state law is pretty much all you're going to have to grapple with, but still check into them. Make sure. Um, because it would really suck to buy a gun that you can't legally carry in your state for whatever reason, or um, if they have magazine capacity restrictions, you need to know about that. So, there's that. And um, as far as carrying it goes, don't illegally carry it. That's stupid. If you're going to have it in your car with you, uh, the ways that you can keep a gun in a car get very specific. Like, if you have a concealed carry permit, then most jurisdictions are going to let you do whatever the fuck you want for the most part. Some places, not so much. Even if you have a concealed carry permit, there are sp specific ways that you have to have the gun in the car. If you don't have a carry permit, then almost every state is going to have some weird fucking... <laughs> some draconian, arcane shit that you have to go through. So, like, for example, you might have to have it in your glove box with the glove box locked. Or, better yet, you might have to have the pistol itself unloaded with a lock through it and then put that into your glove box and lock your glove box. Or like a safe inside your glove box. Or something like that. It gets weird, so be aware of that. And make sure that you're not going to be breaking any of those laws because they will bust your ass for that shit. Um... Let's see, what else? Uh, safety features. If you have kids in the house, please get a safe. If you're... If you don't necessarily have... If you don't have your own kids, but say, like, your relatives bring their kids over often, get a safe. And use it. <laughs> of course. Um, shit like that. Uh, if, if you think there's pretty much any real risk of break-in, again, get a safe. Um... You might want to, if you can bolt it to the floor or something, that would be good. Or if it's just, like, super excessively heavy, um, that's going to deter, like, your lowest common denominator criminals. Um, you know, you, you got to consider shit like that. Controlling unauthorized access, access is a big deal. Um, you know, know the rules of firearm safety. Um, there are big four. Uh, for example, you know, don't point a gun at anybody. Always act as if it's loaded, whether it is or it isn't. Stuff like that. Know those rules, because as long as you follow them, chances are everything's going to be fine. But as soon as you start to break even just one rule, especially the pointing it at somebody thing, that's when accidents start to happen. Um, ask Alec Baldwin. <laughs> even if you think it's unloaded, or you think it has like fake rounds in it or something, um, you could be wrong. Your memory could be incorrect. Uh, you could just not know what you're talking about. You could be wrong. And so if you pointed at somebody and pulled the trigger, you could kill somebody. Um, so don't break those rules. And, of course, yeah, know them. Um, I don't know that I have too much else to say. Uh, I think I went over just about every, like, big thing. So um, I'll just leave it here instead of continuing to ramble. So good luck out there. Um... If you have any questions, ask. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on things, but I know a thing or two. I'm a bit of a nerd about it. So, um, and also get more, get more viewpoints, get more opinions, get more, you know, broaden your data set. You know, there are a whole lot of these types of videos out here. Listen to a bunch of them, compare them to each other, and see what they have in common and what they have different. Um, and try things out. Uh, don't just buy something immediately without really, you know, using it first. Um, aside from that, I think that's it for now. So I'll see you around. Okay. I kind of lied. I thought of one more thing. Um, single action, double action, single, double, double action only. Um, some people will just call that striker fired, uh, depends. Um, so there's, there are ways we can make this more complicated than what it really is. But basically single action is referring to the trigger. So it's double action. Um, single action means that the trigger only does one thing, and that is drop the hammer or the striker. Um, the hammer, if you've ever seen a revolver, that thingy on the back, 
You might see cowboys pulling it back when they're like, you know, threatening each other or whatever. Um, that's the hammer. Uh, a striker is what fires the gun on a semi-auto that doesn't have a hammer. Uh, it's just an internal mechanism that basically it's like a spring system on the firing pin so that whenever the trigger is pulled, it sends that striker forward, jams the firing pin forward into the primer of the cartridge, igniting it, shoots the round, etc. So single action means that the hammer has to be cocked somehow before you can pull the trigger. Um, single action only is not common these days. Single action only is like your old, old cowboy revolvers, like legitimate, you know, actually used in the old west. Um, they still sell reproductions of those or even modern versions that still use the single action only system. You could pretty well easily recognize them because they have that weird kind of curvy grip that comes kind of off the back and then down. I forget what it's called. There's a particular name for it. But um, you'd know it if you've seen it. Um, really uncommon for that. There is the 1911 pistol. It's really a series. Um, they're classic pistols. Uh, they're named 1911 because, you know, that's about when they came out. Um, they were adopted for U.S. military service, I think, in 1911. Because uh, I know that a version of them was carried in World War One, And then in World War Two again, they were still the like main service sidearm of the U S military. And they remained so until I think the eighties when the Beretta M nine came in. Uh, but anyways, those are single action only and they're semi-auto pistols, not revolvers. Um, the thing is when a semi-auto pistol has a hammer, when the slide reciprocates, it pushes that hammer back itself. Um, so for a 1911, for example, a semi-auto with a hammer, you carry it with the hammer cocked, but a manual safety on, so you can't pull the trigger. And so when you go to use it, all you have to do is flick the safety off, and you can start firing because the hammer is already back. If you were to carry it with the hammer down, so like forward against the slide, you would have to manually pull the hammer back to fire it because it's a single action only. Now, most pistols on the market these days, if they have a hammer, they're going to be what's called single double action. And what that means basically is you can manually pull the hammer back if you want to and get single action. Or you can, there's a, a mechanism on it called a decocker. So that after you load the gun, you can hit that lever and it puts the hammer down safely. If you don't have a decocker, please don't put your hammer down manually. <laughs> um, but if you hit the decocker, it puts the hammer down manually. You can carry the gun with the safety off. Um, you could pull the trigger that way but it would be a really long, really heavy trigger pull because the double action part means that pulling the trigger both cocks the hammer and then sends it forward. So two actions, double action trigger. Um, so like your 1911, if you don't have the hammer cocked manually, the trigger doesn't do anything because it's single action only. It can't perform that action of pulling the hammer back for you. That's only for double actions. So a single double, for example, the first gun I ever bought, my CZ Compact, is a single double, but it doesn't have a decocker. It only has a manual safety. So it can fire with the hammer down, but it's never really in a hammer down position. Um, because as soon as I load it, the hammer goes back. I don't have a decocker and it's not a good idea to, because basically what you have to do is like pinch the hammer with your fingers and then pull the trigger and gently let the hammer down so that it doesn't fire the round. That's how you manually decock a pistol with no decocker. And that's just dumb honestly. So you carry it with the manual safety on and the hammer back. Um, but when, as long as the hammer is back, it's in that single action condition. The thing is, a double action trigger is known to be longer and heavier in general. A single action trigger has a really short, really light, really crisp trigger pull. It's really nice to fire that way. And of course, like I said, um, the slide reciprocating as you fire the pistol puts the hammer back for you. So after, even if you, you're carrying a double action pistol and you're carrying it hammered down so that's forward against the slide, that first trigger pull is going to be really long and heavy, but then after that is going to be in single action mode because that first round as you fire it, the slide is going to come back and cock the hammer for you. So after that, the trigger pulls are going to be short, light, and crisp. The thing is, it takes a little getting used to 
to get in the habit of that first really heavy and long trigger pull and then a completely different trigger pull after that. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, it takes some getting used to. I'm not going to say don't get one, but definitely train with it, practice with it, be comfortable with that particular mechanism. Um, double action only is your striker fires for the most part. Um, they don't have a hammer, like a Glock, for example. They don't have a hammer for you to do anything with. Um, so every trigger pull is going to be the same. And it's not going to be, you know, quite as long and heavy as like a hammer-fired double-action trigger pull usually. But it's also not going to be as, as short and light as a single-action-only trigger pull. Um, it's somewhere in the middle. And, of course, since they have no hammer or anything, most of the time they don't have a manual safety either. Um, so there's that. That's what those terms mean. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend a beginner to go with a single action only, like a 1911. Um, get something that either has a decocker or is striker fired or something like that. Um, so that way uh, you don't have to worry about... Because the safety is another one of those things where if you're drawing your pistol, it's because you need it immediately to potentially preserve your life. Um, or a loved one's life, for example. Um, and so when you add a manual safety into that list of things that you need to do to get the pistol in action, that introduces a step that you may fuck up. You know, you may not totally get the safety off. You may forget that the safety's on. Um, you may just fumble it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Um, if you've had the pistol for years, you practice with it a lot, you can train it to the point where it's totally fine. Um, but if you're not going to be, like, you know, training with the pistol regularly, um, not just taking it to your range and using live ammunition, but using dry fire practice at home, which is something you should look up, by the way. Um, if you're not going to be that into it, I wouldn't recommend getting something with a manual safety. And maybe not a decocker either. I would say if you're going to be a somewhat more casual gun owner... Just go with something with a striker, because um, that's going to be less for you to have to familiarize yourself with, less things that you have to overcome with training. Um, so there's that. But I think with that said, I'm finally out of things that I wanted to bring up. So again, I'll see you later.